There? There I'm on? Yeah. Okay, cool. I can't ever remember. Is it forward, back, sideways? Am I supposed to rip it off and throw it in the trash can? I can't ever remember. Um, so we're going to jump right into it tonight. And let me roll this out toward the center. And by the way, George, thank you, brother. My goodness. I, I've told them privately, and I'll tell you uh, publicly, one of the greatest joys that I have personally in a week is sharing the stage with any one of the people that's up here. Um, I love my team. I, I really do. Um, okay. So, I want to introduce you to three different individuals that you might, you might have at least, I know you've, heard of one because of a very famous account that happened around his name. Y'all have heard of this guy, right? Baal, we, we say the actual pronunciation correctly is Baal, but Baal is, is how we would pronounce it. Um, This is another guy here, Malik. Okay. And the last one of these three is a dear sister named Ishtar. Um, now, if you went through the study Return of the Gods with me, these three names are extremely familiar to you. And I believe me, I understand um, maybe some of the some of the pushback that was coming uh, when we talked about a study called Return of the Gods. And you're saying, well, there's no gods but one, and that's Jehovah. And you would be 100% right. But all three of these are listed in Scripture, and we're gonna. I'll actually show you just one of the places where they're, they're listed multiple times in Scripture. But all three of these are listed in Scripture. Now, God's was capitalized on the front of the book because it's the proper name of the book. That's the only reason it was capitalized. But all three of these are little g gods. Okay? Everybody understand that? All right. Each of these three has... Um, a, a, a characteristic, for lack of a better term, just like if you had, I'm going to put these three up here, will, word, and wind. These are the three persons of the Trinity. So God the will, God the word, God the wind. And you say, those don't look familiar. Well, I had uh, a pastor one time that, let me, uh, let me just put out here so you know who I'm talking about. I had a pastor one time at a church that I attended uh, just outside of Atlanta that said, Look through Scripture, and you will find 100% of the time God the Father wills it, God the Son says it, God the Holy Spirit does it. I was like, I'll take that challenge. I went and looked. Well, you know, Bird was right. And here's the deal. Prior, prior to... Uh, prior to Bethlehem, you had, it was the will, the word, and the wind. Now, because of the whole pastor thing and being alliteration, after Bethlehem, I'm going to say sire, but it, that's just a 
name for father, okay? So sire, son, spirit. Same three persons. John, uh, the, the disciple that wrote the gospel of John, if you'll remember, in the very first uh, chapter, very first verse of the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the living word. Later on in John chapter 1, it says, and then the word became flesh. Now, my personal belief and opinion is that, and I'm going, I say opinion kind of loosely, but if you look at Hebrews chapter 1, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, what, uh, what, uh, to what angel has God ever said, today you have become my son? Now, at that particular point, Jesus, the word, became known to us as the son. It doesn't mean he didn't exist before then. He is just as eternal. It's just that prior to Bethlehem, we see these three. After Bethlehem, we see these three. The exact same persons of the Trinity, just two different ways of basically referring to this one. So, the, and, and again, that's based on Hebrews chapter 1. If you want to look that up, you can. There's actually a couple of verses there in Hebrews chapter 1 that will show you what I'm talking about here. But um, so just as each of these, and remember, God the Father wills it, God the Son says it, God the Spirit does it. So it was the Holy Spirit that was actually who is, who is symbolized by fire, wind, and oil throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit was the one that was actually leading the people of Israel through the wilderness as a cloud by day, fire by night. It actually says that the wind of God was what parted the Red Sea when the Israelites came out of Egypt. So that is the Holy Spirit of God doing all of those things. Jesus was the one and the person of the Trinity that actually spoke the worlds into existence. It, 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 it was he because it in, a, in one of you might have to help me out with, with the verse here. Dennis, you might can call it out pretty quick. I don't know. I don't want to put you on the spot. But there's a verse uh, in the New Testament that says that in and through him were all things made. Uh, and I think it's in either Corinthians or Thessalonians maybe. Colossians, thank you. Um, so that, it, that is talking about Jesus the Son. He being the Word is the one that spoke everything into existence. That's what we talked about last week coming out of Genesis chapter 1. So that is the, the living Word of God in the beginning speaking. Now, all three persons of the Trinity speak. God the Father and the Holy Spirit both speak. That's in Scripture as well. But there is one characteristic that I want to pay it that I want to pay close attention to before we jump back over here to Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar, and that is the very the, that is this that because the Son is the Word, He had to be the one of the three persons of the Trinity that came to Earth to die for me and you. Neither the Father nor the Spirit could have done that. Not that they couldn't have died. They could have. They could have taken on flesh just like the Son did and died. That part they could have done. What they couldn't do, because it's not in their characteristic, is that every time God the Word, God the Son speaks, something is created. And the church, me and you, had to be established. We had to be created. In order for redemption to take place, in order for the bride of Christ to be established, in order for God's perfect plan to happen, the church had to be created. And so 
the, it was only this one based on an overview of the entire word of God that could actually handle that because every time he speaks, something is created. So let's go back and return to our three fellows we were talking, or two fellows and a whatever, uh, that we were talking about a minute ago. Each of these three have characteristics. And for lack of just board space and to keep from taking time me writing on the board, I'm going to simplify them as much as I can. So Baal's job is to turn God's people away from God. Okay? If you look all the way through the account of Scripture, when you see Baal appearing, his job was to turn the people away from God. Moloch's job is your kids. He wants your kids. Whatever it takes, he's coming after your children or your grandchildren. Ishtar's job is sex. She wants to destroy the reproduction deal. Now, if you'll remember last week, what did we say that God blessed? It was the first blessing mentioned in Scripture. What was it that he blessed first? Multiplication. multiplication. And the way that multiplication happens, the first, the first uh, created thing that he blessed in that regard was birds, fish, different things like that. It says he blessed them and then told them to be fruitful and multiply. Now, there is one thing, and this definitely bears mentioning given what I put over here. There is only one creation that was ever made that involved all three persons of the Trinity. What was it? Man. Genesis says, let us make man in our image. All three persons of the Trinity were involved in creating me and you. They poured something out of every single one of them into us. That didn't happen in any other part of creation, but it did into me and you. So Ishtar is coming after the first blessing. She's coming after your ability to reproduce, to multiply. All, and and you, you, I can maybe hear the you know, questions going off in your head. Kevin, what does this have to do with Genesis? So glad you asked. Okay, um, I think maybe Shirley even has uh, these verses on Scripture because Shirley's awesome like that. Y'all say, thanks, Shirley. Thanks, Shirley. There you go. All right, so um, in Numbers 25, verses 1 through 3, and before we go too far, I'm going to throw uh, in Diana or whoever's on camera, Shirley's got the verses up. Can we put those up here for a moment maybe? Um, but in Numbers 25, 1 through 3, uh, it says this. While the Israelites were camped at Acacia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods. Now, it's a little g god. So the Israelites feasted with them and worshiped the gods of Moab. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal of Peor, Peor, causing the Lord's anger to blaze against his people. So we see the Israelites turning from God. That's the first time that by name 
Baal is mentioned in Scripture. And the Israelites are turning from God. Now let's look at the first time Moloch is mentioned in Scripture, and that's found in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21. And again, I think we've got that up here. It says, Do not permit any of your children to be offered as a sacrifice to Moloch, for you must not bring shame on the name of your God. I am the Lord. Now, guys, I know that what I'm going to say here is a little bit graphic, and um, we may actually put this on streaming, so if you're watching on a streaming thing, if we do inside, decide to do that, then, uh, I mean, not stream live, but put it on YouTube. If, so if you're watching and you have children there in the room, maybe ask them to go out of the room for a moment, um, because what we're going to discuss here, uh, and hit pause, because um, I ain't going to wait, I ain't got time, all right? Um, but what I'm going to talk here is a wee bit graphic. Moloch was represented by a big statue that kind of had a cow or a bull head on a human body and with arms that were outstretched like so. And the parents of the babies would bring their children and place them on the arm of Moloch, roll their kids down the arms, and their kids would fall into a pit of fire. That's in Scripture. That's what God was talking about here. So it's not, it's not like, which God gets, God, God, you know, he gets angry at sin, right? So there, but... Th Anytime we start messing with kids, God don't like it. I mean, like he really don't like it. If you'll remember, you know, uh, when Jesus was here and when people were, you know, saying, you know, talking about messing with kids, Jesus said, oh, it'd be better for them if a millstone were tied around their neck and they were cast into the ocean. I mean, there, there's something about an innocent child, even to us even to the lost world. And so here we see the horror that Moloch represents. And then there's Ishtar. Now, there is, Ishtar has several names, actually. Um, Ishtar is simply one of them. But another name, uh, or another name for Ishtar was the Queen of Heaven, which in just a moment we're going to see her named that in, uh, in the book of Jeremiah in just a minute. She's also called Ashtoreth, Asherah, as in Asherah poles, if you've ever read about those in Scripture, Inanna or Diana. All of those are actually talking about Ishtar. Her legend has her named to another little g-god named Tammuz. And we will talk about Tammuz in just a moment. But there is even a month on our calendar, or actually, there, there is a month named after Tammuz on our calendar. Anybody that, and please let it be someone that did not attend Return of the Gods because you will know this. But what month on our calendar is, is representative of Tammuz at the exact same time of year? June. Guess what month or guess what celebration happens every June? Gay Pride. Why do you think that happens during June? Because Ishtar the God who represents robbing us of our blessing of multiplication and sexual perversion is, is making it so. You see, Scripture tells us there's nothing new under the... Exactly. Everything is on a pattern. Things come in cyclical circles. And we talk about 
you know, how we're surprised by this or we're surprised by that. We shouldn't be. We, we, we look at, you know, and we, we think, oh, God, you know, well, why did you pick this particular part to do what you did this particular time of year? If you look at the way that God has acted in the past, it's a very good predictor of how he will act in the future. You say, well, Kevin, is there any proof of that? Sure there is. Let me, let me just, we, we talked about the Jewish wedding during the Lord's Supper this last time. You remember all that? And how all of that was laid out in a pattern and how that pattern can clearly be seen in Scripture of, of even leading up to the second coming of Jesus? Well, here's another pattern that maybe you hadn't thought of. There are seven Jewish feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Those are the seven. And that's the order in which they appear on our calendar year. Pass so the four that we know as the fall feast, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, have all been fulfilled prophetically. Now they were instituted, Passover. What event started Passover? Yeah. When, when, when the, they, the people of Israel were told to put the blood of the lamb over their doorpost so that the death angel would pass over their house and they wouldn't lose their firstborn. That's why it's named Passover. So that was when it started. But little did they know that that was actually a prophetic prophecy or foretelling of another major event. And what was it? Crucifixion. The crucifixion. Passover was fulfilled prophetically by the crucifixion. The next feast is unleavened bread. What fulfilled that uh, feast? The burial of Jesus. The next one is first fruits. What fulfilled that one? The resurrection. The next one is Pentecost. What fulfilled that one? Well, when the Holy Spirit fell, right? And, and you had the Holy Spirit coming in, mighty rushing wind, flaming tongues of fire. That was when that particular feast was fulfilled. There are three feasts that have yet to be fulfilled. Trumpets, can anybody think of, a, of something that's supposed to happen in the Christian world that surrounds trumpets? Oh, right, okay. Atonement, um, well... There would be the nation of Israel actually permanently being atoned when they recognize Jesus as their Messiah. And then tabernacles. Anybody know what the definition of a tabernacle is? It's a dwelling. It's when the, the whole reason that Moses' tabernacle, when they were out in the wilderness for the 40 years, the whole reason that the tabernacle was called the tabernacle is because God tabernacled in, among his people. He dwelled among his people. Can anybody think of anything in scripture where God will once again dwell among his people? It lasts for a thousand years, the millennial reign. So if you're, if you're thinking, well, I wonder when this, 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 this. Guys, you really only need to look at the patterns. Because God has really already laid it out. Okay. So, these three guys, throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, they're hard at work. We don't see them in the New Testament. Why? Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is more powerful than they are. And it pushed them out of the way. You and I have something within us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We have something that we carry that pushes the power of darkness right back to hell where it came from. We just got to represent him rightly. Amen. That's all we got to do. Okay. 
Gosh, I'm going to start preaching in a minute if I ain't careful. All right, I'm going to get rid of these for a moment. Well, our, I, you know what? I do want to show you one more thing. So just remember, Baal, Moloch, Ishtar for a minute. And by the way, on a side note, Ishtar is where we get the name Easter. That's why, for the most part, we use Resurrection Sunday around here, is to stay away from that. Now, I do put, or Easter, on the audio announcement, only for those people who are lost, because they might not know when or what Resurrection Sunday stands for. So you'll hear me put Easter on an audio announcement, or communion on an audio announcement, even though we refer to it as Resurrection Sunday or the Lord's Supper, only for those who might not know what those two terms mean. Okay? So that's why, that's why I do that. All right. Um, now, looking when Ishtar first appeared in Scripture was in Jeremiah 7, 18. And it says this, No wonder I am so angry. Watch how the children gather wood and the fathers build sacrificial fires. See how the women knead dough and make cakes to offer to the queen of heaven. That's Ishtar. And they pour out liquid offerings to their idol gods. Now, in the, in the old Mosaic tabernacle, there was something called a drink offering. The drink offering was taken from the table of showbread, and most, most uh, theologians and, and people who have studied this out believe that it was poured out not at the table of showbread where it was taken, but over at the altar of incense, which was just before you went into the Holy of Holies. It was the last piece of furniture right up against the veil. And so here we see where Satan is even mimicking the drink offering poured out in the tabernacle by these ladies pouring out a drink offering to Ishtar. And God was ticked. Look at, uh, let's look at Ezekiel 8.14. Now, if you'll remember, there's this guy in white linen, and he's taking Ezekiel around. And so the guy in white linen takes him to this north gate of the Lord's temple, and here's what it says. He brought me to the north gate of the Lord's temple, and some women were sitting there weeping for the god Tammuz. Now, Tammuz, according to the, the uh, legend or whatever you want to call it with Ishtar, was married to Ishtar and died, and Ishtar mourned for Tammuz. Therefore, anything that has to do with Tammuz, like her, her um, priestesses and the priests and different things, that's why they would often mourn around June for Tammuz was because he was dead. And it was in the month of Tammuz that they would be mourning. And just, you know, in case you hadn't thought about it, and I believe it was at the church in Corinth, Dad, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't the church in Corinth where the temple to Diana was so prevalent? Yeah. So when Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he's talking about how they should uh, carry out their worship services and whatnot, it was because they were, at, they were getting people that were involved in believers in Jesus that were coming directly out of the temple of Diana that was there in, uh, in Corinth. Okay, so I had this cup up here last week, and um, I wanted to show you something just to clear up something. I, I did this with, with Barb a while back. So this is Starbucks, and I have no, I guess it's a mermaid. I don't know. It kind of looks like a mermaid-type person right here on, on, the, uh, on the cup. But so we're going to, because it's female, we're going to say that this is Ishtar, okay? Now, all three of those gods, little g, had something concrete that represented them. They were all spirits, but they were represented by something tangible. Remember I told you Moloch had the bull head with the human body? So when the people would see Ishtar, they didn't know what was behind it all. 
They had no clue that there was a demonic spirit that was being represented by this idol. They thought, because of their own reasoning, that they were worshiping something that would give them power. But this cup is all white. It doesn't even have a clear lid on it, right? So I could tell you this is a cup of coffee. And I hand it to you to drink, and because you trust me, whoop. But oops, I forgot. That's the cup I put cyanide in. And you wouldn't know it until it was too late. This is the predicament of the children of Israel. They were worshiping these false gods, these idols, but they didn't know what it was they were worshiping until it was too late. The parents didn't realize that they had done wrong by sacrificing their children until their children were never coming back. It's what Satan still does. If he told you the end result from the beginning, you would never do it. And this is where it all started. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're going to put it on the screen. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? There's the spirit of Baal. First appearance. You don't see him by name. But here's the old spirit of Baal saying, did God really say? Now, this was Lucifer, okay? But Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar, they learned from the best. Lucifer's the general. They get, but Baal, Moloch, and Ishtar get their marching orders from Lucifer himself. He taught them well. So we see that thing that's been carried down in Baal right here in old Lucifer. And he says, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Now, where did she get that part about touching it from? She made it up. Adam told her. Who knows? God never said don't touch it, but he did say don't eat it. So she kind of went one past what, what God actually said. And then the serpent comes back. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. This is what Lucifer always desired, right? To be like God. He looked up at God and said, I can be like the Most High. People talk about eating the fruit being the original sin, but it wasn't. It was jealousy. It was when Lucifer got jealous of the Most High God and he compared himself to him. That's why jealousy and comparison, ladies, it is incredibly dangerous when you start comparing your looks, your worth to a magazine cover. Don't do it. Husbands, I could say the same thing about comparing your wives to a magazine cover. That is original sin. The devil first causes us to doubt God. He has repeated this throughout history. It is in the Baal moment of first mention, did God really say? Now, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, we see sin classified in three different ways, and I'm, we're going to put this on the screen for you. It says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The temptation of Eve 
covered all three of these categories. Let's look at Genesis 3, 6. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful. There's the lust of the eyes. And its fruit looked delicious. There's the lust of the flesh. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. There's the pride of life. All three of the categories listed in 1 John are there. And it says, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her. It wasn't that Eve had to go back and say, Adam, 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 look what I found. Look what I found. Adam was there. And it might have even been that when she said, Lord God said that we're not to touch it, it might have been all Adam that went, God said, don't touch it or eat it. We don't know. That's not there. But she got don't touch it from somewhere. As far as those three categories, just as a side note, because what if, if I don't show you anything else in Genesis, the whole reason that I wanted to do Genesis was so you could see how everything started right in the first few chapters of Genesis, and it carries all the way through to Revelation 22. Look here. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, I'll give you the cattle on a thousand hills, lust of the eyes. Turn these stones into bread. Lust of the flesh. Jump from the temple and angels will save you. Pride of life. There's nothing new under the sun. Not one thing. Whatever you're being tempted with tonight, it falls into one of those three. In their act of disobedience, in other words, Adam and Eve, what they did for every single person in history is they took their kids our kids, our grandkids' kids, and they threw them into the fire of hell. There's Moloch. And it started with their own child, Cain, at the, at, or, uh, I'm sorry, Abel, at the, at the hand of their other son, Cain. And this sin nature for the world would lead to the sexual perversion that only Ishtar can bring in the first two or three verses of Genesis 6. And it says this in, in verses 1 through 8. Then the people began to multiply on the earth. So see, uh, the, the devil got in on that blessing of multiplication. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God, in other words, demons, saw the beautiful women and took any that they wanted as their wives. In other words, they had sex with them. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In other words, I'm going to cut their lives short because I can't put up with this for so long. And it says, in their future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days and for some times after, giant Nephilites or Nephilim lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. So these big giants that resulted from DNA of a woman mixing with DNA from a demon became these huge giants and great warriors that people looked up to and cheered and said, go get them. And they, they violently clashed with each other and they cheered because of the, the destruction that they were leaving. This wasn't the type of hero that we see depicted in most comic books like Spider-Man or Superman that stands for truth, justice, and the American way and will, and will come to the rescue of others. This was people who were killing others. Think Goliath. Someone who probably whose DNA probably carried down from the DNA of either Noah's wife or one of his son's wives. Man no longer had a separate racial identity from demons because it resulted in the Nephilim, a race of half-breed men and demons. It was the result of a broken covenant. Well, there's that word that we put on the board last week again, covenant. And it is why Noah 
was the only righteous man found on earth before the flood. Goliath is thought to be the result of the Nephilim line carried through Noah's sons or their wives. Look at Genesis 3, 7 through 13. At that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Do you all think God didn't know? Sure he knew. Why did he have to call out? God can't look on sin. The covenant had been broken. The eyes of holiness cannot look on sin. So they were hidden, and he could not see them. Moving on. Where are you at the end of verse 9, verse 10? He replied, in other words, Adam, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? Well, the serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. It's like, you know, it's this kind of a game, right? Have you ever wondered why they covered their sexual organs with loincloths and not anything else on their body? Why they didn't cover their face? I'll tell you. Because your sexual organs are the sign of a broken covenant. Before that time, there was nothing wrong with being naked. It was, it was, it was a display of the covenant that God had made with man. I will be your God. You'll be my people. I'm going to bless you and be fruitful and multiply. And that was where it happened. But the moment that covenant was broken, somehow Adam and Eve both knew that's what needed to be covered. Intuition told them. And that's where the fig leaves found themselves because the covenant had been broken. Scripture says that all sin is outside the body, but sexual sin is against one's own body. Ever wondered why that is? Because our bodies visually mark the covenant of man to God. And when we commit sexual sin, we have made a visible lie out of our covenant with holy God. That's why. Why did God not know where they were? Well, I've already gotten to that point. It's because they weren't in, in, in a right covenant. In, in and through all of that, Adam cut him, Adam and Eve both, cut themselves off from their relationship with the divine and each other. Adam passes the blame to Eve, and he renames her Eve. If you'll remember, last week we talked about where he said, oh, this is woman. Remember, whoa, man, you know. We, 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 Adam said, this is woman. You are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Well, now, you know, everybody considers it to be this high honor that he named her Eve, the mother of all living. I think it was a separation tactic. She was no longer flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. God, if you'll remember, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, names both of them Adam or mankind or humankind depending on the translation you look at. The old King James said that he named them both Adam. But now, Adam changes her name to Eve. He's still Adam, but she's Eve. She's not like him anymore. It was a separation tactic. God created one commandment or law. 
don't eat of the tree. The fall of mankind into sin led to 10 laws that were given to Moses by God at Mount Sinai. That led to 1600 or 613 laws before Moses was done. David reduced the 613 down to 15. Isaiah reduced those 15 down to 11. Micah reduced those 11 down to 3. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And then Jesus reduced those 3 down to 2. What are they? There you go. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two laws rest all the laws and the prophets. Now, understand, and what really should mean a lot to me and you is that Jesus could have made it one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. But he added the second. Why? Because that's who he is. And if it's important to him, it should be important to us. After all, he's also put into scripture, what man says that they love the Lord their God yet hates his brother because to him who says that, he is a liar. If you have racial racial prejudice in your heart, if you say, well, I can't love a homosexual, look at what they're doing, the love of God is not in you. And you say, well, Kevin, somebody's got to tell them the truth. That is that is 100% right. You tell them the truth about what Jesus can do to obliterate their sin by his love for them in his death on the cross. But what changes them is up to the Holy Spirit. That's not your job. Our job is to introduce Jesus. And what person who is involved in sin wants to see some holier-than-thou righteous churchgoer show up at their front door preaching at them and throwing a Bible at them and saying, here's what you ought to believe. Here's what you ought to be doing. Here's all this, that, and the other. When they're saying, yeah, I've seen how you kicked your own wounded. Why would I want to be like you, you hypocrite? Tell me I'm wrong. I'm not wrong. And it's time that we start putting the mirror down in front of ourselves. And the mirror is the word of God. The mirror is exactly what we're diving into. It is, it is allowing the word to be the washing of the water by the word, what it says in Ephesians 5. It's that laver where, that's made of mirrors that we look over into it and we see about what, what's, what about God is not like us and what about us is not like God. And we change ourselves according to what we see. Genesis chapter 3, and surely I'm only going to do the first couple of... Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to read this whole passage. Genesis 3.20. Then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take, uh, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it, then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which had, he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Another first mention here was the first sacrifice ever made. Did anybody catch it? The animal skins that God made to put over them. Tell me where they came from if God didn't sacrifice for somebody else's sin. Jesus said, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. One of the reasons that he said that is because he made the first sacrifice and he made the last one on the cross. There never needs to be another sacrifice thanks to the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. It is done once and forever. Praise be to him. Adam and Eve could not be allowed to live forever in a fallen state. So God banished them from Eden, then placed a flaming sword and angels to guard the tree of life. Think about this. If they had eaten of the tree of life in a fallen state, redemption would have been impossible because of the way that God made the tree of life. Anyone who eats of the tree of life will live forever. 
If you eat of the tree of life in a fallen state, you live forever in a fallen state. Redemption becomes impossible. So God had to banish them from Eden, place the flaming sword out in front, two cherubim to guard it, so that they wouldn't eat of the tree of life, which, by the way, is now in heaven, according to the book of Revelation. And one day, we will eat of it, because there, there will be no sin. The curse will be obliterated. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he, Jesus, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Jesus crushed his head on the cross of Calvary. Which, by the way, that right there is the very first prophecy in Scripture. And God made it. Because of this, dying physically became and is a blessing as it brings us into the presence of God where, according to Revelation, the tree of God now is, or the tree of life now is. Look at Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life flowing with water clear as crystal, continuously pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The river was flowing in the middle of the street of the city and on either side of the river was the tree of life with its 12 kinds of ripe fruit according to each month of the year. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations and every curse will be broken and no longer exist. That means there's no sin in heaven and we never have to put up with it. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there in that city. His loving servants will serve him. They will always see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will never need the light of the sun or a lamp because the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign as kings forever and ever. And one more time, evening gives way to morning. I'll see you next week.